The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Two North or Be Eaten. Chapter 33 The Sundering. When Janner woke, he saw before his face the antenna of a bug. Then the fog in his mind cleared, and he recognized the gaunt face and sweeping mustache of Raunchy McHiggins. The previous night's events came back to him with a panic that caused him to gasp and sit up straight. The movement woke Tink, who yawned and rubbed his eyes. Breakfast, he mumbled. Then he too remembered their situation and opened his eyes as wide as his sleepiness allowed. Hush, young fellers, Raunchy said, his croaking voice a strange comfort to Janner. It's all right. I don't know where your keepers or your sister are, but the fangs aren't here for the moment. Raunchy glanced at his front windows. They may be back soon with questions for me, though, and you can't be here. They might sack the whole place just for the joy of it. Happens all the time. Janner shook his head, trying to take in all Raunchy was telling him, but sleep still clouded his thinking. Wait, you betrayed us! Mig Landers! Betrayed me, lad. I intended to get you safe to the ice prairies, just as I figured Gammon would want me to. Either Mig Landers was one of Gammon's men, and he has reasons for wanting you in the hands of the Fangs, or Mig Landers is a thief and a liar. I think Mig is the problem, not Gammon. But then, I'm just an old tavern boss. What do I know? What? Where do we go? Tink asked. Not sure yet, but you need to be scarce by the time customers start filing in. Children are a rare thing in this town. An Arian one's even rarer. He winked. How did he know we were An Arian? Janner thought. And why were children rare in Dugtown? Then he remembered the burrow. The last thing Poto had said before the florid sword appeared was that they should meet at the burrow. He assumed his grandfather meant the burrow on the hill outside of town, the one where they had spent the night. If indeed the others escaped... Poto must have found another strander tunnel, and the family would be back at the burrow even now, waiting for Janner and Tink to arrive. Janner stood and pulled Tink up with him. I don't mean to trouble you, Mr. McHiggins, sir, said Tink, but do you have breakfast? Of course I do. Nobody leaves the roundish widow with a rumble in his belly. The roll should be done by now. Raunchy led the boys into the kitchen, removed a pan of hot, buttered rolls from the oven, and served them with a bowl full of sugar berries mashed into a curious paste, which they ate with wooden spoons. Tink guzzled a cup of water from Raunchy's sister and burped, then asked nicely for a refill. Mr. McHiggins, we need to find our family, Janner said finally. There's a strander burrow at the edge of town. Shh! Keep your voice down, lad, if you're going to talk about such things. Never know when a strander might have an ear to the wall. They don't take it easy on you if you blab their secrets. And if you know the location of a burrow, then that's a big secret. Leave me out of it. Sorry, sir, Janner said. We just need to get to the east side of Dugtown up on the hill, Tink said between bites. He'd already finished three buttered rolls and the second cup of water and was slurping up the sugar berries. The hill on the east side of Dugtown, Raunchy repeated, twirling his mustache between his thumb and forefinger. Near the river? Yes, sir, Janner said. Ah, that's a fair walk from here, but it's easy enough to find. Just follow Riverside Road till it winds away from the river. The tavern boss croaked out directions, explaining to them how to take a shortcut to avoid a dangerous stretch of Riverside Road. The more he talked, the higher the sun flew, and without warning, Dugtown awoke. Outside the roundish widow, wagons squealed, squeaked past, people mur murmured and grouched, and birds fluttered about in flocks. The great beast of the city stirred into motion, its citizens crawling about on its back like fleas on a dog. Now you lads be careful. This city was a fearful spot long before the fangs came to scree. Now that trolls and lizards trapes the streets, things are worse than ever. The fangs drive us like slaves. 
They don't pay for their drink or their food or for the damage when they fight. They mock and imprison, and the children... Ranchi's croaking voice clogged. They take the children. There are hardly any left on the south side of the city. The black carriage comes and takes what it pleases, be it child or mother. How could they kidnap a mother? Even stranders have mothers and shrink from doing a woman harm, especially a woman with a child. Janner saw a coloring, colored drawing on the wall beside the cupboard. In it, a younger, happier, raunchy McKiggin stood beside a pretty woman who cradled a baby. I'm sorry, sir, he said. Raunchy took a deep breath. He turned and nodded at the boys. Go, be wary. Then he dried his hands on his apron and shuffled through the swinging door and into the common room where he croaked a greeting to his first customers. Janner and Tink stood alone on the threshold of the door that led to the alley. The tidy kitchen of the roundish widow was a hen's nest of safety, a place where the nearest thing they had to a friend had fed them and filled their flasks with clean water. On the other side of the door stretched a world of fangs and trolls and scoundrels, a world through which they must pass in order to find their family again. Janner peeked around the corner and into the alley. To his relief, Mig Lander's body was gone, probably tossed into the river sometime in the night. Ready? he asked, feeling the gravity of the moment. Yep. Tink scratched his armpit with one hand and picked sugarberry seeds from his teeth with the other. Janner led his little brother into the alley and left the roundish widow behind. Looking out from the quiet alley at Riverside Road, all Janner could think of was the thundering of white water of the mighty Blap. Wagons, horses, trolls, fangs, merchants, fishermen, boat captains, carriages, cries of surprise and anger and irritation, squeaking wheels, tromping boots, jangling pots and pans, cracking whips, all meshed into a violent, unstoppable rush that scared Janner frozen. Never had he seen so many people in one place. He'd believed the Dragon Day Festival to be a great ruckus, and for the Glipwood Township it was. But now he saw that Glipwood and its humble festival was nothing but a quaint diversion in a quiet corner of a giant world. This was one street in a city of hundreds of such streets, on a continent of many such cities, and a world of... Well, nobody knew how many continents sprawled across air we are. Footnote 1. The maps bore great blank swaths as far west of Scree, and nobody knew what lay to the east of the Kilridge Mountains. These unknown areas beyond the edges of the maps were referred to as the places beyond the edges of the maps. Janner watched the pandemonium with the feeling he was about to leap into the white water of the mighty Blap and be swept away to certain death. Look at all these people, Tink said, beaming. Yeah, this is going to be harder than I thought, Janner said gravely. According to Ranchi's directions, we need to turn left, Tink said. Left is east. Come on. And before Janner could stop him, Tink plunged into the river of people. After several harrowing minutes fighting the current, being bumped, cursed at, elbowed, and tripped, Janner realized the traffic on the river side of the street moved east, the direction they wanted to go. Tink! Janner cried, get to the other side of the street, the other side. Tink ran into the path of a carriage and the horse reared. Tink darted to the right and out of sight. With great annoyance, the horse and driver pushed on. Janner waited until the carriage passed, then ducked in front of a whiskery fisherman toting a string of red gill over one shoulder. He stood on his tiptoes in the narrow refuge in the center of the street, where the crowd grumbled past him on either side in different directions. There was no sign of Tink. Janner wanted to call out for him, but was wary of drawing too much attention to himself. And then Tink's head appeared above the crowd under the awning of a boathouse on the far side of the street. Janner clenched his teeth, waited for a space to open, and dashed into the traffic. He pushed for the far side and nearly fell twice. Before he reached the boathouse, an empty space, a sort of bubble in the crowd appeared around Janner, and an unbearable odor filled his nostrils. He didn't need to turn around to know a troll was nearby. Janner lowered his head and pushed through to the roadside. Tink stood on a barrel, staring wide-eyed at the troll as it rumbled past. Dugtowners with purple faces scrambled to escape its smell. 
The troll thudded along, twirling a club around its finger on a loop of twine. It looked happy as a fed baby, and its chin glistened with slobber. Don't do that, Janner snapped as he yanked Tink from the barrel by his shirt collar. Do what? Tink jerked away from Janner and glared at him. We need to stay close. All we did was cross the street, and I already lost you. The only way we'll both get to the burrow is if we stay together. Why? We both know where it is, Tink said hotly, straightening to his full height, which was a head shorter than his brother. I was standing right there when McHiggins gave you directions. Do you think I'm not smart enough to find it alone? It's my job to protect you. What if I don't want to be protected? You don't have a choice. I'm a throne warden. You're a king. That's the way it is. I have to keep you safe. I have to get you to the ice prairies. Well, what if I don't want to go to the ice prairies? What if I want to go home? Are you serious? Janna rolled his eyes. We can't go home. Besides, Glipwood was never really our home anyway. Our home is Anaria, and you're the king. Tink sighed and turned away, mumbling something under his breath. What did you say? Janner demanded. Nothing. Tink, what did you say? Tink gave Janner a seething look. I said I don't want to be a king, and don't call me Tink anymore. My name is Kalmar. The crowds moved past in a blur, too busy to notice two boys arguing in the shade of a boathouse. Janner lowered his voice. Fine then, Kalmar, but it doesn't matter if you want to be a king or not. I'm the throne warden, and I'm going to get you safe to the burrow. If you don't want to be king, tell it to Mama and Grandpa. Tink's eyes burned, and a scowl spread across his face. A look Janner had only seen when the two of them wrestled or when they played ships and sharks. When Tink was trapped, immobile, and unable to move his arms or his legs, it was a look of anger, but even more, it was a look of panic. Then Tink said something that cut to Janner's heart. I don't want this. I don't want any of it. Leave me alone. And he ran. The Wing Feather Saga by Andrew Peterson. Book Two North or Be Eaten. Chapter 34 A Watcher in the Shadows. Janner stood motionless, staring at the empty space where Tink had just been. His skin went clammy, and he realized in a snap what he, that he was alone. It wasn't just that Tink had run away, Janner realized, though the thought made him so angry he wanted to punch his brother in the nose. It was that Tink had abandoned him. The river of Dugtowner seemed to grow in speed and size and hostility. The burrow, where he desperately hoped the rest of his family waited, suddenly seemed impossibly far away, as unreachable a destination as the moon itself. Why would Tink, Janner refused to think of him as Kalmar, do such a thing? He knew his little brother was uncomfortable with the idea of being king, but Janner was unprepared for this. Perhaps this was Tink's way of proving himself to his older brother. Janna remembered the many times he had thought the worst of Tink, only to be proven wrong. It was true he had been hard on his younger brother, probably too hard. But this? Fine, he thought bitterly. Let him find his own way to the burrow. Janna steeled his nerves, rubbed his hands together, put his head down, and joined the mad flow of traffic on Riverside Road. He tripped, hopped, and ducked, straining to read the street signs over countless heads as he passed. Raunchy said if he took a left at Crimshaw Way, then a right on Till Tilling Street, he would eventually merge with Riverside again. He said it was the best way to bypass the busiest and most dangerous stretch, where the fangs were ferried across the Blap to Torboro. Janner looked for Tink, craning his neck in every direction as he bustled along, but saw no trace. It would have been hard to find anyone in such chaos, especially someone as small and quick as Tink. Janna began playing the many things he would scream at his little brother once they were safe in the burrow again. His thoughts were interrupted by the glimpse of a street sign, Crimshaw Way. A crowd perched on the... Uh, a crow perched at the top of the pole. Janna zipped between fishermen, seamstresses, and donkeys harnessed to carts laden with fish meat until he stood with his hands on his knees, winded, only a few doors past Cremshaw Way. 
The door behind him swung open, and out came four fangs of Dang. They laughed and staggered down the step to the sidewalk where Janner stood. He froze and stared at his feet. The fangs burped and cackled past, then disappeared into the crowd. Janner darted past a store that sold fish nets, then around the corner to Cremshaw Way. Cremshaw stretched upward from the river and into the heart of Dugtown. Angry as he was at Tink, Janner hoped to catch up to him here. He told himself he was mainly worried for Tink's safety, but he was just as worried for his own. He tried not to imagine what might happen if he were to lose his way in this maze of streets. A woman with a kind face carried a basket down the street toward Janner. Excuse me, ma'am, he said timidly. I'm looking for my brother. Have you seen a little boy a little shorter than I am? She regarded him sadly, then passed without a word and turned into the rush of Riverside Road. The same was true of everyone who saw him. They looked at him with great sorrow, said nothing, and moved on. Janner followed Grem Kremshaw past several cross streets, dirt roads lined with plain gray houses, much like the one where they had emerged the previous night, until, muttering thanks to Raunchy McHiggins and his good directions, Janner finally saw the word Tilling on a street sign. The road stretched away in both directions, another gray lane littered with clucking chickens, shards of pottery, and old broken boards. The street boasted no houses, only deserted storefronts with broken windows, the doors long since stolen and used elsewhere. Behind Janner, men and women moved up and down Cremshaw in forlorn silence, but Tilling stood empty as a graveyard. Janner was glad it was still morning, because he wasn't sure he would have had the courage to walk such a dead street in the dark of night. He passed empty building after empty building, looking back with longing at Cremshaw, where at least he wasn't alone. When the dead street curved to the right and concealed Cremshaw completely, he called in a voice barely above a whisper, Tink? There was no echo. The empty windows and doorways seemed to swallow the sound. Broken glass crackled beneath his feet. Rats scurried in the walls of the old buildings. Crows cursed and fussed on perches in the windows of the upper rooms and on the rails of crooked balconies. Tink! He called again, louder. Janner imagined eyes watching him from the shadows, eyes attached to trolls or fangs or stranders waiting for the right moment to burst onto the street and seize him. So he did what any normal 12-year-old boy would do. He ran as fast as he could. He leapt over piles of garbage and weaved between the bricks and rotten barrels that littered the road, aching to reach the far end of Tilling Street where Raunchy had promised it emptied into Riverside Road again. He no longer cared how much noise he made. If someone or something heard him puff by, they would have to be fast indeed to catch him, frightened as he was. But the road came to an abrupt end. Janner skidded to a halt before a stone wall as high and flat as the old brick buildings on either side. There was no way out other than the way he'd come. Why would Raunchy send him this way? He had seemed so kind, so helpful, and the little man had been certain this was the safest, shortest route to the east side of Dugtown. Janner turned his back to the wall so he could see the street down which he had just run. Nothing moved. That was good. If anything had been lurking in the shadows, it would have attacked by now. In the distance, Janner heard the muted sounds of a busy street. If he could just get over the wall, he could find his way to Riverside Road without having to braved the creepy emptiness of Tilling Street again. He crept to the alley between the two nearest buildings, but the rear was blocked by another wall. After inspecting a few more alleyways, he discovered that the wall stretched seamlessly behind every building on either side of the street. It was at the very end of what would make an excellent trap. What worried him most, even more than Raunchy's faulty directions, was that Tink wasn't here either. Janner sighed. Some throne warden he was turning out to be. He had to find Tink, and he couldn't do that cowering at the end of Tilling Street. He took a deep breath and ran back the way he had come, not out of fear for himself this time, but because he was desperate to find his little brother. Halfway back, he heard voices. Without a second thought, Janner ducked through a doorway of the nearest building. The floor was covered with dust and bits of broken glass. The rear of the building was draped in shadows, and against the right wall, a rickety wooden stairway rose past the ceiling. The voices drew near. 
Janner sneaked behind the stairway and peeked through the space between two steps. Three men appeared on the road. Their long hair was matted and black. They wore dark clothes and spoke with such thick Doug Towner's accent that Janner had difficulty understanding what they said. He heard the word forks, which sounded like farks. And the men's eyes shifted in a way that reminded him of thwops in the garden back home. More than once, he was sure one of the scraggly men looked directly at him, but each time the man's eyes moved on, untroubled. It was so quiet in the decrepit building that Janner could hear his own heart beating. A spider skittered across the step to kill a fly caught in its web, and he heard that, too. The dead hush of Tilling Street made every tiny sound conspicuous, from the crunch of dirt beneath Janner's boot to the harsh voices of the men outside. So after only a few moments in his hiding place, Janner became aware of another sound, very near. Somewhere, just behind him, in the deeper shadows, something was breathing. He closed his eyes and begged the meg and begged the maker to let it be his imagination. Slowly, very slowly, he turned and saw, in the corner of the hollow beneath the stair, the unmistakable glint of two eyes watching him. Janner was unable to move. If a gargan rock roach or a toothy cow had appeared before him, he wouldn't have been more afraid. Whoever, or whatever, it was stared at him with such malicious satisfaction that Janner felt like the fly in the spider's web. The figure lunged 